All right, everyone, thank you all for coming to Astronomy on Tap. This is now our fourth session of Astronomy on Tap. Uh, for those of you that have never been here before, and there's a good amount of good people here, which is awesome, uh, Astronomy on Tap is part of a larger nationwide program. So there's actually multiple places like New York, Seattle, Texas. Um, it's actually spread out to the UK and Chile. Of course, ours is the best. Um, but it's part of a bigger network, and we're happy to have everyone here tonight. So the format of Astronomy on Tap is we're going to have a talk by Andrew Shannon about Planet Nine. Then we're going to have a brief trivia session, followed by a talk by Jacob about the solar eclipse. Then a break. Then we'll get the trivia answers, and then we'll have our last talk by Jason Wright about how he may or may not have discovered aliens. So. I have to uh, I have to advertise also the official Astronomy on Tap beer, the Space Wheelie, the Intergalactic Sour. So you should check that out if you have a chance. And also on the back of your trivia sheets, there's a little survey that lets us know how you found out about Astronomy on Tap. So please just take a minute to fill that out if you heard about us through Facebook or through the radio or through some flyer. Uh, please just let us know. There are donation boxes also up at the front here. So we've set it up so you can vote on if you think there are if you think there are aliens, do you think they are the benevolent close encounters of the third kind type? Or if you think they are the we're gonna kill you kind from Independence Day, uh, you can vote by putting money into the boxes. Last time we had Star Trek versus Star Wars, and unfortunately Star Trek won. <laughs> There's a lot of disagreement about that result. Um, so please uh, Please donate a few dollars. It goes towards our trivia prizes. And I think that's all the announcements that I have. So we're going to get started here with Andrew Shannon, and he's going to tell us about Planet 9 or Planet 10. That's a good setup. And also, sorry, uh, one last thing to mention. There is time for questions after the talk, so please uh, hold all your questions till after the talk. Really? Yeah. Okay. How do I? I've been practicing my. Book. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for coming because if I was giving this talk to an empty bar, I would feel like such a bore. Um, so I was asked uh, by the organizers to talk about Planet Nine because they think I know something about the outer solar system, which is true, and they think I know something about Planet Nine, which you can make up your own mind. Um, normally, when you give sort of public science talks, you want people to go away feeling like they know more than they knew when they came in, like they've learned something. That is really not my goal. I kind of want you to leave feeling like you know less than you knew when you came in. And hopefully by the end, it'll make sense as to why that's what I want to do. So I'm going to talk about Planet Nine. Um, hopefully you've uh, seen something in the news about this, or else um, the motivations to why it's exciting may not be so apparent. Anyways, um, so I was asked to make this pretty casual. Um, you know this is about the most formal clothes I uh, own. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to say, since time immemorial, which is a British legal term, meaning since before King Richard I became king in 1189, um, humans have known about five planets. If you go outside at night, you know, this is a pretty... Can I just... <laughs> I'll move it closer. This is really disturbing. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, you outside at night? Can you hear me in the back now? Yes? Who can't hear me? Show of hands. No one? Good, okay. So you go outside at night, you see the stars. The stars are in the same positions they always are. The sky is a whole moon, but stars stay fixed. Uh, but if you watch, there are a few stars that wander around and don't obey this. And so we've known about Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn as long as we can remember, for all of recorded history, as something different, planets. Um, later we figured out that we live on a planet as well, bringing the total number of planets to six. And it stayed this way until 1781. Yes. Um, so it kind of bothers me a little bit as a professional astronomer. In the 1500s, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, Brahe, and Newton figured out that planets go around uh, on orbits around the sun that are ellipses, and this is caused by gravity. And then in astrophysics, sort of 
nothing happened until like the early 1900s when Cecilia Payne figured out the stars were made of hydrogen, or uh, Hubble figured out the galaxies were big bunches, uh, bunches of stars. And so I asked myself, like, what were they doing for hundreds of years? Well, it turns out what they were doing was really making accurate maps where stars were. So once you go to the telescope, when you go outside, you see, depending on how bright it is and where you are by street lamps, hundreds to maybe thousands of stars. There's a few thousand stars you can see with your eye. So you can make a chart of where they all are, and then you're done. And this was done thousands of years ago. But once you make a telescope, you can see more. So they would make telescopes, and they would look, and they would make charts of where all the stars were. And they just did this for hundreds of years, making better telescopes to see more stars. So uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel uh, lived on the border between Hanover and France, Germany and France. And when the Seven Years' War broke out, which I think Americans call the French and Indian War? Yes. Yes, look at that, I know something American. Really. Um, he decided this was not a good place to live. So he moved to England, uh, who's a man of means, as many early astronomers were, and he started just charting stars. And one day, um, he noticed the star was a little bit fuzzy. So this was not surprising. They knew about nebulae, which were sort of fuzzy, fixed points. They knew about comets, which were fuzzy things that moved around in the sky. And so he said, I wonder which this is. And he came back a few days later, it had moved, and he said, oh, this is probably a comet. And that's really cool. If you find a comet, it gets named after you. Um, his sister was his assistant. She found some comets. One of them got named after her. So, you know, that's pretty cool. It's a, you're a rich guy. You want to show off. You found something. But as he, he studied it, he didn't see any tail. And after a while, he's like, comet should have tails. This doesn't have a tail. Maybe I found a new planet, which would be even cooler. Uh, but you don't get to name the planet after yourself. So if you found a planet, what would you name it? That wouldn't excite you at all? <laughs> Uranus. That would be a very professional answer. Now, William was not that kind of guy. He was a very outside-the-box thinker, and he decided he would name his new planet George. I swear that's what he decided to do. Now, I was asked to make this informal. We want to make you know, science seem not intimidating so that uh, young people might be interested in a career in science, uh, what have you. But I've got to be honest, sometimes astronomers are kind of snooty. And they decided that George was not an okay name for a planet. <laughs> and, and after a lot of argument, it became known as Uranus. Okay, great. So we followed Uranus as it goes around the sky. But this turns out to be kind of boring. So Uranus takes about 80, a little over 80 years to around the sun. So that's a long time. That's your whole career to maybe watch it go once. But a French astronomer, Alexis Couvard, Bouvard, said, okay, this is actually a mistake, right? Like, we've been spending all our time just making detailed star charts, right? I know where Uranus was when they found it. If I look in the past to where it was, maybe I'll see it. And when he did this, he saw that for 100 years, people had been seeing Uranus and just not realizing what it was. So by doing this, you can see you got the whole orbit for Uranus right here. Sorry, I didn't get a blackboard, so this is, we'll have to do math without a blackboard. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, really? <laughs> All right, good. Um, so we fit the orbit of Uranus and said, well, I fit Jupiter and Saturn's orbits very well with this historical data. They're perfect. Uranus is, is not so good. It fits pretty well, but um, uh, laser point is more here. So you can see there are these leftover errors. And he did what any good theoretical astronomer would do, what I would do, and he said, you know, probably the guys who took this observation were not very good. Astronomy is tough. You have to stay up all night. And that is just, you know, at the end of the night, you're dabbing away at things and maybe they were wrong. So, well, there could be something beyond Uranus causing these errors, but probably they're just bad measurements. Um, nonetheless, he sent these, uh, these measurements to Le Verrier, uh, Urbain Jean-Joseph Le Verrier en France, who said, and he said, look, you know, I have these residuals, can you, can you solve them? And it was a tough time to do this. You had to do math with pencil and paper. Um, it took a long time, but after a while, Le Verrier did the math and he said, aha, yes, I've solved this and I can do it. So he went to the Académie des Sciences and said, you know, there are these residuals that uh, Bouvard has from Uranus, I've solved them. You can explain everything. If there's an additional planet beyond Uranus, it's at this point in the sky, if you just point your telescope, you'll see it. And everyone at the academy went, this is very good. I'm very impressed. This is an excellent bit of mathematics. 
so long. And uh, so Le Verrier went home, and he came back to the academy maybe six months later and said, all right, look, I've done these calculations to explain what we see in Uranus's orbit. There's another planet here that's tugging on Uranus. This is where it is in the sky. This is how you find it. And the academy was suitably impressed. They went, this is some excellent mathematics. You've done a great job. And then Larry went home, and no one did anything. So this came to the third time, and by this point, the Verrier is uh, thinking, there's no young people here, isn't there? Okay. He's thinking, je m'en prie, on s'y voit. No one will do it. He goes back to the academy a third time and says, look, this is where there's another planet. Go and point your telescopes, you know, and find the, well, Uranus is the seventh planet, twelfth planet at this point, because we have four asteroids with little twin planets. And you'll see it. And they were very impressed by his math, and no one did it. So eventually, he wrote a letter out of France to the director of the Berlin Observatory. And the observatory director, this is the painting of Le Verrier, obviously, in the relations of the square plants. The director, the director of the observatory, uh, Johann Gottfried Gall, and I had to write that down, which, which you'll see how this much this matters, said, oh, I don't want to do this. Stay up all night. You know, this is not me. I'm a gentleman astronomer. I have cigars to smoke and, and, and brandy to sniff. But I, I have a graduate student who I maybe don't care for that much, or I don't know what their situation was, um, named Heinrich Louis de Rest. I'll send him to go and look. Because we do have some recent star charts of this area. And so he sent uh, Heinrich there, and in just over an hour, Heinrich had found Neptune, pointing where Le Verrier had told him the point. Um, so unfortunately, cigars were not to be smoked, and brandy was not to be sniffed for another day. But I mean, this was a great discovery and an enormous validation of everything Le Verrier had done. He became very famous and very important in France. And we can see that by studying the orbit of Neptune, our observations, and just modeling the things that we see, we discovered this new planet, Neptune. And it was almost where it was supposed to be, very close. Much better than really it had any right to be. So Leveria becomes very important in France, and he says, well, what should I do? Well, the answer is, you know, I became important because I did the math of the orbits of planets and found a new planet, so what am I going to do? I'll do it again. Now, most planets, uh, the math worked very well. If you had Newton's gravity, you could calculate their orbits, and they were where they were supposed to be. Um, but for Mercury, this was not quite true. So Mercury has an eccentric orbit. Not this eccentric, but it's an ellipse. And where this closest point to the sun is, the perihelion, rotates around the sun by 5,700 seconds of arc per century. Now, for reasons I don't totally understand, Astronomers use seconds of arc, where it's, it's a Babylonian mathematical system where you have 360 degrees in a circle, 60 minutes of arc in a degree, and 60 seconds of arc in a minute. It's super not fun, but there it is. Okay, and if you if you look at the perturbations from the known planets, uh, from the fact that the sun is kind of squashed, you could get 5,500 and some odd seconds of arc per century of movement of the Earth. But you were still about half a percent. Sorry half a percent, two-thirds of a percent behind the actual observed motion. So he said, aha, there must be a planet interior to Mercury, which I will call Vulcan. Vulcan is the god of something, fire and warm things that you would find near the sun. So I will say that there's this planet there, and I will calculate its orbit. And he did so, and he said, oh, this is where this planet will be. Go and look for it. Um, when you write observatories and ask them to point their telescopes at the sun, <laughs> you do not get super good responses. Um, so it's not at the sun, right? It would be a little bit off to the side. But if you go out during the day, you cannot just look near the sun and hope that it will be okay. Do not take your telescopes and look near the sun. Do not take your binoculars and look near the sun. Just There were a couple of tricks you could do. You could take images of the sun and look for dots that might be planets passing in front of it. You could wait for a, a total eclipse, and then you could look near the sun comparatively safely. And so people did this. And from time to time, someone would say, aha, I found Vulcan, but they could never be repeated. And, and it, you know, at 10 they seemed to get more and more skeptical. So what was going on? Um, so it's not like Neptune. I mean, Leverrier died. He thought he had discovered two planets in Vulcan and, and Neptune. But really, it was just that our understanding of gravity was very slightly imperfect. Um, Mercury was processing by about one degree per century. 
and we were only able to calculate that 99 point something percent accurately. With our theory of gravity at the time, which works very well in real life, in our lives for sandwiches and bowling balls and stuff, but for planets deep in the gravitational well of the sun was only 99 point something percent good. And so when Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, he could calculate this remaining 42, 43 seconds of arc per century and correct the orbit. And today we know there are no planets interior to Mercury. There's no rocks interior to Mercury bigger than something like five miles across. It fits it very, very well. So in this case, again, we saw perturbations in the solar system. We thought maybe it's planets, but it was really our understanding of the physics that was a little bit off. But there's no reason to be discouraged, right? Leverrier found Neptune. He was very famous and became president, president de la Académie des Sciences, I think. So people kept with it. Um, Clyde Tombaugh was also a gentleman astronomer. He had a lot of money and he wanted to be famous. So he said, aha, I will, I will not look for a new planet because you stay up at night. And honestly, telescopes in this era, you went up with a bunch of photographic plates and a thermos full of coffee. And you came down at the end of the night with those photographic plates and a thermos full of some other warm liquid. It was not super fun. You know, like a rich, distinguished gentleman didn't do that. He sat around and took photos. But he said, oh, I will get my daddy to buy me an observatory and I will do the calculations. And he said, aha, there is a little bit, when we fit Neptune Uranus, it works pretty well, but there's a little bit left over. And when you model that, you see that there should be some very big planet, maybe 10 or 100 times as big as the Earth beyond Neptune. So let's go look for it. Well, he built his observatory and he said, aha, you know, I'm a distinguished gentleman. I'm better than this, but I'll hire this uh, farm boy from Kansas and I'll send him up into the telescope to look and he'll do it because he needs the money and will also eventually become famous. So he went, this is um, Percival Wool. I was name backwards. This is Clyde Tombaugh. <laughs> First guy was Percival Wool. <clears throat> My bad. So he went, and he went to look, and uh, he found it. So if you look at this, this is planet F. Ooh. Right, so if, if planet X was some big Neptune, you know, tens of Earth mass kind of thing, you would see it on this picture. It would look like this. But he knew from before that the way you find things in the solar system is not by just looking at them. Neptune was a fluke, right? It's like Uranus. You watch things that move, and then they're in the solar system. So if I play this... He took two pictures and flashed them back and forth. And so I assume everyone can see planet X in this picture. Yeah? No? So it's right here and right here. So it does, it does look very little. So this is, this is in fact Pluto, the thing he found for planet X. Does anyone know why it looks so little? It's because it is little. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, I mean, it was... On the New York Times next day, above the fold, for those of you who are old enough to know what that means, um, you know, ninth planet discovered uh, lies far beyond Neptune. This is all true. After 25 years search, so he was quite dedicated. Um, okay, it was Arizona is where he built his telescope. The sphere, possibly larger than Jupiter, meets predictions. And this is where things really went awry. So when you're a scientist and you make a prediction, and then you go out and look, and you see what you said was going to be there, or you think you see it, you go, ah, I was really on the mark here. I'm very smart. There's a thing I said there would be. I must have been totally right all along. And so they said, ah, oh, Pluto is a planet. Now, in um, Lowell's day, they thought maybe a few tens of Earth masses. So this is a kind of fun plot. The mass of Pluto, as we believed it was, against time, when we made this estimate. And so when... First of all, Lowell started doing this. They thought it was 10, 20, 30 times the mass of the Earth. By the time they discovered it in 1930, they thought, oh, maybe it'll be about the mass of the Earth. And then later, as we got better positions on Neptune and the perturbations, it became Mars mass. And eventually, when we discovered it had a moon, we knew it was less massive than our own moon. And if you follow this trend line, it disappeared in 1984. Uh, and that didn't happen. But the point was, you know, we'd started out thinking it's something like Neptune. So, of course, it was a planet. It was making all these perturbations, but as time went by, we went new. That's actually not what's happening. It's very small. So why did they think there was this planet uh, X causing perturbations to Uranus? Uh, well, it turns out we had the mass of Neptune wrong by about a half a percent. And that was enough to muck up the models to produce these residuals. And so when Voyager 2 flew by Neptune, 
Two, yes, okay. They got the correct mass for Neptune, and then you put it in, and all the residuals go away. And you're happy that you know everything in the solar system. Um, but of course, at this time, Pluto was the only thing beyond Neptune. We had originally thought it was a planet, so of course it was a planet. Um, but really, there was nothing there. It was just our data was bad. So we had three cases. One where we saw effects in the solar system we thought was a planet, and it was, right? Neptune was a planet. Vulcan was us not understanding the physics well enough to know what goes on. And Planet X was bad data. <laughs> just measurements we didn't totally understand. Well, that's where we sat um, until not too long ago. So uh, this is a picture of everything. Right, so this is the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and the solar system. You can see the sun because it's star-shaped. Um, and then beyond there, we started finding additional <coughs> objects, kind of like Pluto in the 1990s, 1992, 1993. This plot is from 2002 when we found a couple hundred. And they just lie beyond Neptune, just kind of like asteroids. They mostly have pretty circular orbits. We think they, those ones probably form where they are today. Some, like Neptune, have these more uh, elliptical orbits that come close to Neptune. And we think that Neptune pushed those things out, and they interact with Neptune today, and that's how they got these more eccentric orbits. So that was fine. This was the edge of the solar system. There were some rocks, right? These are maybe typically 100 miles across, but the total mass is less than the moon. It's not a big deal. It's just, you know, dust at the edge. And that was fine until 2003, and we found this object out here, right? So we were here, finding all these things very close, sort of all of the orbit of Pluto, and we found this object. Does anyone know what this object is? The color should give it away. No? All right, so it's called Sedna. It's about 600 miles across. It's very red. Now, at first, you know, maybe it's just um, on an eccentric orbit, right? You saw Pluto was eccentric, goes near Neptune, then it goes away. So maybe it's, it's very unlikely you find eccentric things far away, but, you know, it's one object. It could be anything. Um, but it wasn't. When we measured its orbit, it looked like this. It doesn't come anywhere near anything. <laughs> and so this is kind of, this is a big problem, but it depends on how you want to think about it. So maybe it's not elliptical enough. If it came close to Neptune, we'd go, oh, it's just the farthest, most elliptical thing that comes near Neptune, form closer in. Or if it was on a circular orbit, we'd go, oh, it far, formed farther out than we thought things were forming, but, you know, no big deal. But here, detached from the solar system, and yet very elliptical, we were very puzzled. Now, in astronomy, we have an excellent technique for dealing with one puzzling object. We ignore it. <laughs> one puzzling object could be anything. You never know. Any kind of weird things can happen once, right? It's just one thing. Maybe it was any kind of weird thing. And for another 10 years, from 2003 to 2012, it was the only object we knew like this. So we said, ah, uh, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but who cares? But in 2012, um, we tried a second object like this. 2012 VP 113, which is a less romantic name than Sedna, but there you are. Um, and then another and another. And so people started to take notice and say, actually, okay, we have Sedna and 2012 VP 113, which stay very far away. But when you look at object, the, orbit, the orbits of objects in the other solar systems, so they're the planets, but the outermost, about half a dozen objects, have this weird orbital property where they all stay kind of far away from Neptune, not all as far as Sedna does, but far. And they're all oriented in the same way in the sky, and they're all positioned the same way in the sky. So they all have an orientation, sort of, if you think of the solar system as a plane, they're all tilted to the plane in the same way, and they're all in the same part of the sky. Now, same part of the sky, okay, maybe that's because where you look is a bit weird, but tilted the same way is very tough to explain. And so, I guess nine months ago now, um, two astronomers at Caltech, Mike Brown and Constantine Batagin, said, aha, we can explain this if there's a large planet that's sort of opposite of where they are. And they originally constituted did some numerical work, uh, but then later with computer simulations showed actually you can reduce these kind of orbits from such an object. It would need to be about ten times the mass of the Earth. It's too massive and it scatters everything away, not massive enough, and it can't shepherd them. Um, but there it is. And so they had six. Six is an intriguing number of objects. It makes it unlikely that it's chance, but not totally impossible. Um, after they announced this, I think we found one more object that 
also fit very well with this pattern. Um, and one that was totally the opposite way, but actually when you look at their numerical simulations, they got some that were totally the opposite way. And so we you make statistical arguments about how likely it is, and people don't really believe you because there are a lot of biases that go into how you construct this. But this is the argument for why there's a planet nine that's causing this, this orientation of things. So is it is it like Neptune? Is this what it is? Is there any other explanation? Well, yeah, there can be other explanations. Um, so this is a map of the sky from the Canary Islands. This is uh, a type of telescope you put out there to evaluate how good the sky is to take pictures. Now if I wanted to look for things far in the solar system, where would I want to look? Okay, let's, let's cheer then. <laughs> who, who would like to look here? Nobody? How about up here? No? Um, maybe over here? Yeah. Sort of, yeah. So this is, this is a big problem. Running through the middle of here is the Milky Way. And so if you look for things there, you see so many things. And it's very hard to distinguish what's going on. So this can create a bias in where we see objects beyond Neptune, although not really in how their orbits are oriented. That bias probably can't be created by just how we're looking. But if we can explain half of it, then the statistical power goes down by a lot. Is that the only thing could be new physics, maybe, that we're missing? Well, the answer is maybe. So uh, Anne-Marie Madigan, who's a professor at Colorado, has shown that if you have these very eccentric orbits all lying in a plane, and you just give them a little kick, uh, if they're massive enough, their gravity amongst one another can bring them all up out of the plane and produce this mutual tilt so that everyone is tilted in the same fashion. Is it, is it feasible for the outer solar system? Uh, sort of early answers suggest you would need a lot more mass than we thought was likely, but maybe not so much that it's totally infeasible. So, um, as we stand today, can Planet Nine be a planet that's shepherding the outer solar system bodies to produce this signature we see? Yes, it could be. There definitely is a place where you could put this Planet Nine, it would have all the properties you would expect, and we would not have yet seen it in existing astronomical surveys. And Mike and Constantine are currently leading a survey to go and look for it in the remaining part of Skyworks. And if that's true, they'd say, and they're probably right in this, that we'll know about it in the next couple of years. Could it be an observational sort of error where we thought that there was this clustering effect, but really it's because we don't understand our observations totally well? Yes, it could be. So to partially address this, a uh, survey on the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope has started doing a very careful job of sort of keeping track of where they look, how sensitive they are, and so forth, and they've discovered a few objects that fit this pattern, but they can show that in their case it's consistent with just being random, and it's because of the way they're avoiding the galactic plane and so forth. Could it be new physics? Um, maybe. We have a promising mechanism, but it has not been demonstrated that it works, never mind it gives you the correct numerical value. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that. There are three examples, and it could be any one of them. Um, and I think I'm supposed to leave for questions. Have I? No, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right, so we do have uh, time for questions if anyone has any questions. Did you say a few thousand stars? Or you could tell with your naked eye? Yeah, naked eye is about, I think it's about 3,000 stars that are naked eye visible, something like this. There's more in the southern hemisphere because it's the center of the galaxy than the southern hemisphere. Um, but not by a lot. I mean, here you have street lights. Uh, I hope. God, I hope I knew that. Look, like, I do computer stuff. Simulation work, like this kind of thing, right? If you ask, like, really, when I look for things on the sky, I'm not super good at it. <laughs> All right, so I gotta ask: Have have people seriously been trying to detect this extra? Thing? Like, are they giving predictions for? If you look over there, you should see in this part of the sky, or is it still just well it's somewhere there? No, so then you know, right? So from from Batting and Brown, from Mike and and, and Constantine's paper, you only know sort of roughly where it be in this band across the sky, but you can show that. Because it's a very elliptical orbit, most of the time it's pretty close. Or not sure that it's pretty close, and you could just see it with like binoculars. And so existing surveys would have found it. And so there's only a, 
relatively limited chunk of sky where it could exist and could have evaded detection so far. Um, but that's still pretty, like,